I'm joined by my colleague, Neil Martin in London. And um, there's Neil in his very fantastic looking office, which is very beautiful. And it certainly dwarfs my rebuilt but unpacked office full of boxes and empty bottles that I didn't want to throw out, but it's very bare here, but we'll try to fix that up. And Neil has the proper British office to look super erudite. It's only Ikea, Antonio, just Ikea. Very good. That's good for the balance sheet, <laughs> no, but, it's fine. No, but it looks fantastic. You've got lots of vinyl back there. So the goal today is just really to have a an open conversation to open it up as much as possible and to um to take all of your questions and just to sort of see what's what's um what's on people's minds so neil thanks very much for for being here thank you um tell us well, first and foremost i hope you and the kids and, and and your wife and every family is all safe in this crazy time my my main concern is that my kids are upstairs watching this on youtube and laughing at me so that's my main concern at the moment well, you know, that's just the way life is, isn't it? Yeah. No, we're all safe. We're all okay. And what is the the mood like in London right now, or in the UK? It's strange. I mean, I was in London uh, just before the lockdown. Um, so that was about three, three and a half weeks ago, four weeks ago. So, I mean, I'm out in Guildford, which is about um 25 minutes train from from london so i'm sort of in the country on the edge of a town but it's it's really eerie i mean it's like uh we're, we're observing the lockdown here i think we're pretty strict so you go out on the streets there's nobody around so it's it's a little bit surreal to be honest like i'm sure everyone's feeling yeah i mean that's again one of the reasons why we like having this you know, we wanted to offer this daily these daily video chats, some of them are webinars, some of them are more conversations, but I mean, I think it is true. We're just dealing with things that we've never seen before. Um, yeah. So I'm curious, you know, it is the springtime and I'm sure that you have the same thing on your calendar, like all the time, every day, you sort of, you might wake up and see like, oh, this is what I was supposed to be doing on this yeah. day. Yeah, yeah. Your calendar is just like mine. It's like, you know, stacked with appointments. So this would be the time that we're tasting 2019 Bordeaux, that we're doing all sorts of visits. You know, you and I do two separate tastings. People may not know this, but I don't even see Neil when we're in Bordeaux except to have supper one night. But there's essentially, there's two completely different sets of tastings, which is something that we wanted to do so that people could have two different viewpoints on these wines, which are so, you know, such a core category, so classic and so cherished in lots of different parts of the world. And we thought it'd be fun to have these two sort of parallel universes. So I know you've started tasting some 2019. And as I recall, you were there during the harvest. So kind of obviously it's super, super early, uh, but just sort of based on what you saw last year and some of the wines you've tasted, any, is, are there any impressions or is it too soon to be able to share anything? Yeah, I mean, it was really, it's, it's very strange for me because I was, in an odd way, I was in a similar situation last year, personally, because I couldn't travel anywhere at this at this time. So I sort of missed the 19 growing season because I had other, other things going on. And then uh, I was, I remember, I remember being in uh, Bordeaux in August in one of the heat spikes when it was like uh, 39 degrees, something like that. And I remember sort of wanting to go, I was with my family and uh, we spent the whole day in the supermarket because you just couldn't you couldn't go out. It was so hot. So, uh, yeah, we had a great time in the supermarket instead of going around Bordeaux just because it was so hot. But I was thinking at the time, you know, my God, what, what what's the the the, half, the, the, the grapes going to be doing? Because it was so hot out in the vineyards. Uh, and then I was down there for the harvest as well. And I got to say, I mean, um, you know, we hear all the sort of the, the, the Baudelaire sort of saying that every year is the best year ever and so on. But I have to say, when I was when I was down there in September for two weeks, it was just blue sky every day. It was like a really perfect growing season. So, you know, just looking at the vines firsthand, going into vineyards, looking at the, the berries coming in, um, going down to the vat rooms and everything as, as it was going on. Yeah, I mean, you could see it's going to be a, a, a pretty good vintage. But I, for me personally, I never like to sort of speculate until I start Prima 
otherwise you've got a sort of preconception and I, I don't want to do that. So, um, you know, comes, when I started the tasting this morning, I sort of, you know, th these were the first wines I tasted and I had about, uh, I've got about 70 samples because nobody's signing anything. I just come downstairs to my doorstep and there's these boxes like piled up, like in, in the road so that if, if somebody is watching this and knows where I live, then they can probably work out that I'm the guy getting the wines and they'll probably disappear. So, um, so yeah, so anyway, I got like sort of 70 samples uh, this week, um, mainly sort of, uh, you know, Bordeaux Superior, uh, a few wines from Mouly, Listrac, you know, that, that sort of level, not really high, but good, good, good names. And then I was tasting them this morning. Um, and the word that came, the, the, the number that came into my head was 2010. It reminded me of 2010 tasting. Um, that's not to say, you know, as, as I go on, I haven't only tasted as a small sample, but yeah, they seemed like good, but different from 18, you know, more tannic, a little bit harder to taste. So um, yeah, it'll be interesting. For sure, for sure. I mean, so for folks listening or watching, we'll get, I think Neil and I will be among the first people to get on a plane when it's deemed safe because that's what we do for work and we love it. Um, and we want to bring you that coverage. So we'll do that as, as fast as we can. I'm curious though, because we've never talked about it. What's your routine like in terms of tasting Primer? Uh, do, you, it, do you focus first on le like, do all the left bank estates first and then do the right bank? Do you sort of go back and forth? I mean, what is it? What does your schedule look like usually? Yeah, I mean, I, I find maybe you're the same, but I find that routine is the best so that I don't have to think about doing something different. So I, I like it the same every year to the point where I almost visit the chateau almost in the same order. So I do the first week uh, visiting each chateau, the, the major chateau. I, that takes about four days. Uh, I mainly start on the left bank. I do one day in Sauten, which is maybe a little bit more unusual, which uh, I've traditionally always done because, um, you know, I love I love Sauten. Somebody's got to drink it and write about it. So uh, I, I love Sauten. I think it's uh, amazing, amazing wines. And so I spend a day down there and I usually do a traditionally I always do one vertical each um, each each Prima. So um, and then, uh, yeah, work through the weekend, then move over to the right bank. And then once I've done all the individual visits, then I start doing the larger scale tastings with, uh, you know, negotiants and consultants, uh, Michel Roland or, um, yeah. you know, the usual, the usual names. The usual names. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big production. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, you know, I'm curious I, about, I, don't, I can't remember how many years ago it was, but I obviously I bought one of your, I have, I'm an owner of one of the super rare books on Pomerol. So yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. What's the, what's the plan for that? Cause I know a lot of people would die to have that book and, and obviously it's out of print now. Yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. Cause people, people say to me, oh, why don't you just print more copies? But when you self publish, that's not the same as picking up the phone and saying, run another 2000 copies off. You've got to finance it. And, you know, with the first book I was, um, you know, they were literally sort of stored in London. I would drive around in my little Renault Clio, pick up a load in the back of my car and then send them off individually to whoever ordered them. So, um, so yeah, I've got to work out a way. I can't, I can't do that again. I'm, I'm, I'm too busy nowadays. So uh, we keep uh, you very busy. Yeah. It's your fault actually, Antonio. So, uh, so uh, I, I'm, I'm just, I, I want to write, I want to do, it, the idea was always to do like a second edition after 10 years because Pomerol has, as you've seen, is Pomerol has changed um, in that period. So I want to sort of, I always think a book is about cap capturing a moment in time. So I'm not, not worried about getting it completely up to date. I want to capture that moment. So I always thought well, I'll do it after 10 years. So that will be like time flies. It will be 10 years, well, in about, Two years time so i need to start working on it now and then um so i'm just looking maybe to do work with a publisher to help out with the logistics because i can't send every copy again yeah so if there's any publishers you know who are listening or watching yeah yeah there's an, an excellent opportunity 
And of course, when you when you sort of self publish and people know you're sending it, every single person wants the book autographed. So I think maybe you were the only person that never asked for it to be autographed, Antonio. I was, I was very hurt when I you sent the order in and you didn't want it autographed. I thought, okay, so it's probably worth more than all the other copies. It's very rare. Well, I could still get it signed, right? You have to pay now. Okay, so that's <laughs> the way to do it. You make no. the autographed ones. You have to. I have to raise the price for the autograph copies and yeah, then, that's, yeah right. that's right. Well, I'm I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings, but I'm glad I'll get a second chance. I'll definitely yeah. get signed. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's that's fantastic. And uh, so here's a so you know obviously so outreach is really important to us right now. We're obviously in this strange world of uh, of social distancing and everyone's wearing a mask if you go out, which you're not supposed to as, little, as much as possible, but clearly unprecedented times. Venice Live is one of the things that we're doing, but it's not the only thing that we're doing. And one of the things we did earlier this year is we had a, a Venice dinner in London, which I couldn't make, but you went to. And it's something that I hope that we will be able to do again uh, as soon as possible. I yeah, I, actually, um... I, I, you might not have seen it. I've actually written that up um, in quite a, what's the word? It's quite a sort of deep and philosophical piece. Um, I literally sent it off today. So hopefully that will appear quite soon. It's, it's, and it's actually about that, that dinner, but talking about how things have changed since then. What's it called? What's the uh, the title of the piece? It's called the Last Supper brackets for now. Yeah, that's scheduled for next Friday. I did. I saw it. I saw it. Yeah, pop up. It's, yeah. it's pretty. Um, you know, so I like to write sort of uh, lots of funny. I like um, I put a lot of humor in. I had no. The one time there's no humor in it. <laughs> it's a bit kind of, you know, but it ends on it ends on a positive note. That was important. So. But it was something I really felt was important to write because I think writing should reflect the times, whatever you're writing about, including wine. So I wanted to write something that reflects what everybody's going through around the world at the moment. Yeah, so we're going to actually publish that on Friday of, uh, of next week. So I saw that on the schedule. Right. But there's this rumor going around that you're taking over the coverage of Barolo. Is that true? Yeah, because the coverage wasn't good enough and um, they wanted someone with a decent palate to take over. So. If, even though it is Barolo and, you know, I will sort of, you know, it was either sort of English sparkling wine or Barolo, so. Um, that must have been desperate if you chose Barolo over English sparkling wine. It must have well, been. I am actually drinking an English sparkling wine at the moment, so uh, it's very good, actually. <laughs> one, tell us about it. Oh, well, I'm drinking, actually, in, in, uh, in the UK on, I think it's Friday, we've got a big a sort of promotional thing where, a lot of uh, consumers and writers are, you know, drinking English sparkling wine. So I thought, I'm drinking this uh, Gusbon Blanc de Noir, which I think is their first release. It's 2016, and uh, it's from down in Kent, which is not too not too far away from me, and uh, it's absolutely delicious. I like I like um, you know I like my sparkling a little bit sharp and steely. Um, which is exactly what this is, and it's uh, absolutely delicious. Are you, you a big fan of English uh, sparkling wine, Antonio? I confess that I really know nothing about it, so I'm going to have to get an immersion course my, the next time I'm in London. I'm actually getting um, I'm getting a few uh, growers, producers to send some samples to me. Well, when, when, when the lockdown started, I thought, well, the easiest way to get samples is to get it from people close to me, because actually where I live, in Guildford is sort of in the heart of, um, not the heart, but there's a lot of wineries around me. So if you go like kind of five minutes drive from here, you've got chalky soils, exactly like you have in uh, Champagne. So and we've got, they say, right? That's the Camerigian, whatever. Yeah, that it's the other side of the basin. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I my where I live is like right on top of it, basically. So we have a lot of vineyards around here. Wow. So anyway, so I asked for a few people to send in some, um, send him some samples. So expect a sort of English sparkling wine report. Maybe maybe in the summertime would be would be good. Fantastic, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Be great. yeah. And so now that you're at home a lot, 
obviously we're all at home a lot, like, like all the time, but now that you're doing a lot of tasting at home, do you like to taste with music on or sort of, do you like more, a more quiet kind of ambiance when you're working? What's your work routine like? Uh, I like, I like to taste with music, but, um, only not, not music. It sounds strange, not music. I really like because otherwise I start thinking about it and singing along to it and losing my concentration. So I sort of, um, I listen to music, which I, it's sort of more background music. So like, uh, maybe a bit of classical or jazz or music that just stays in the, in the background a bit. So, um, so I, 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 I quite like, but out here I've only got uh, a vinyl setup. So I, that's why my records are here because because I'm in the garden. I can't get a connection to the Spotify or anything. So I have to have, um, I have to go back and have vinyl records here. So um, yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I like, if I want to get in the mood for something, music could be quite good. Hmm. How about you? Does it oh. put you off or? No, I almost always have music playing but um, different. If it's a deadline and it's late at night, then I like like very loud rock music because I, I like the adrenaline. My biggest problem with music is if I hear a song and I like it, then, or a piece of music, I might stop working and learn to play it. So right. I think that's part of, you know, I that's like. the way I'm wired, but that's happened a lot, especially in this moment of, of suspension of so many things that are normal. If I'm listening to music and I and something grabs me, I'll just stop everything and then learn to play it on my guitar and then go back. Like to Justin Bieber, something like that. Yeah, Justin Bieber, exactly. Yeah, I heard you a big fan. Yeah, exactly, a big fan, <laughs> big fan. Yeah. I have you, every, you got every that recording in the, every, all this walls are covered with posters here, but you know, no, I'm not gonna show you that side of the wall. I'm showing you the, the respectable side of the wall with the empty bottle. Are they the walls you painted yourself? Because I think I saw an Instagram, your pots of paint, and you were you were saying that you were painting the walls. Well, no, the contractors were here, but that day, see, so I'm gonna just tell everyone, uh, you already know this, but I'm just gonna leak this to our readers. I, I so loved your article on the day of your DRC tasting. Oh yeah. Shamelessly stealing that concept. And when I published my reviews of the 2017s, which you know already, but people watching and listening don't know, it's going to be my day of, like, my day tasting those wines. And that was the day of that paint. And these painters showed up late, like a half an hour late. Then they showed me all of these different paints. And I, as I wrote, like my eyes just glaze over literally between satin and flat and white and dove white. And it's just like way too complicated. And it gave, started to give me like almost like anxiety. I'm like, just paint the walls, like whatever yeah. the hell it is. And because of that, I was 30 minutes late to the DRC tasting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At least you didn't. When, when I had my first DRC tasting, I got the wrong day and I missed the whole day. So I never, I never went to it. So, but it's a shame. I, I was thinking, because I've got, I've got a couple of rooms that need painting. And I thought maybe you could come around and, earn a few extra quid and you could you could paint them for me but me painting your it's the per it's the fastest way to ruin the look is to give me the paintbrush i mean there's other things i can do i can cook but i mean painting and this i'm sure it's easy it's just not something i've ever had any familiarity it's, with it's actually very therapeutic i actually really i'm i'm rubbish at diy but painting is the one thing where you can look at it at the end of the day and you think yeah it's i did that so then you should come here for the touch-ups and stuff. Show me how to do it, yeah. and I'll know how to yeah. do it. Yeah. No, but yeah, so that, that day, I was 30 minutes late to this tasting. However, they always start with a 30 minute sort of welcome. So I'm going down to the city and I'm just thinking, I'm just praying to God they're gonna have the, the champagne welcome because they changed the format this year. They used to do a big tasting here in New York. One day it was all the Psalms, writers, it was like for about six, 50, 60 people. And this year they decided to do it just the writers alone. So it was like 12 people with Aubert de Villain and Bertrand. And all I could think of on the way down to the city was please God, let there be this. I'm not even religious, but I'm just- but Surely, thinking. surely they didn't, they didn't start because you weren't there. And they said, there's no way we're not, we're starting this without Antonio here. So they were just sort of delaying yeah. things. As it turned out, they thankfully had that 30 minute welcome and I got there just in the nick of time. 
<laughs> so it all worked out perfectly. But I was like, I must have lost a pound of like weight just sweating on the way down there because, you know, I mean, you can be late for a lot of things, but that's one of the things that you don't really want to be late for and you don't want to be that late anyway. So that's my story of that and painting. And was was David Beckham at your tasting in the in New York? No, David Beckham. It was just the just the writers, just the, about ten or twelve writers. Really? Oh, that's interesting. I, I th in in the UK, it's 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 more actually. It's like through the morning, and there's probably I don't know how many people through the day, but a lot more than twelve people through the day come and taste the wines, which I think is great because not not many people get the chance to taste it and it's good to see a lot of sommeliers there who can you know because it's what i like about that tasting is you can it's the one where you can really see terroir because it's you're looking at the same great same vintage same wine making technique and it, but just with different vineyards different grand crews so putting, so putting the like artist aside it's interesting is that tasting like an open tasting where you don't have to it doesn't start at a specific time you just sort of get there and then leave when you're done well, it's it's always like through through the morning, so it depends on what time you you get there, and you just pray they haven't run out of Romani Conti. Yeah, because here it sort of has a start and then a finish, so it's sort of like you, you like it definitely starts at a certain hour. Like you don't, yeah. you don't be late. I just made it. Um, yeah. Let's let's um, look at some of the questions because there's a ton of questions here, which which is great. One of the uh, questions is aside from you know we have this we have obviously do the same thing for work. We have a very deep shared passion in music. But aside from that, what have you been doing to sort of occupy the time in this moment? Yeah, it's one of those things where you think you're not gonna be busy, but actually I feel as, as if I'm busier than ever. So, um, you know, I had, um, I mean, I'm, I always work with a big backlog of articles. So, you know, whether there was lockdown or not, whether I can travel or not, I've still got a lot of um, articles that need writing up so they had to be done and then um just sort of also you have to spend time readjusting how you do things like um for just the basic things like receiving samples so usually somebody signs for them but they're not doing that anymore so i've got to so this morning when i taste those bordeaux wines I've got to put them in my car and take them to where I'm going to taste them. But then I'm thinking, okay, I've got to take, um, be careful. So I put my gloves on and, you know, it's all, it's all, it's everything slightly more complicated, but then I guess that's the challenge. You know, it's like, well, I don't want to say it's not possible. You just got to work away around it. So it's a sort of, yeah, a lot of sort of, uh, thinking of different ways of doing things. It takes more time, but, um, you've got to keep, you know, you got to keep doing it. But I think writing takes up a lot of time anyway. I mean, um, I, I love writing. So um, it sort of seems to eat up a lot of the day. So um, yeah, just been been pretty busy still. Yeah, no, I would totally agree. In fact, and as I think I've even posted this on our forum. I, I haven't worked this much this hard since we started this company about six or seven years ago. I mean, it's uh, so, I mean, we're counting our blessings. It's not at all a complaint, but we have, you know, been working in, insanely hard. And and for me personally, yes, uh, a lot of writing. I have, uh, like you, a pretty big backlog of articles. Um, obviously, in this sort of scenario, I think I'm cooking more than I ever have, obviously. <laughs> it's trying not to go out unless it's absolutely essential. So cooking more, reading mm -hmm. more. But seriously, guys watching this, I mean, the the pace here is you'll see over the next couple of weeks and months the content pipeline is very robust and everybody is working really really hard and mm. for us it's not just the the content pipeline but also just trying to be as present as possible this series for example which was an idea that i kind of developed in a couple of days and then our team in new york just executed like flawlessly but i didn't give them much time so they've been fantastic and so for us, I mean, it's, yeah, I was always trained this way, you know, when things are slow or uncertain, that's when you turn on the jet engines. So that's what Venice is yeah. right now. We turn on the jet engines on everything. So we are busier than I think we've ever been. And it's a great feeling. And we feel very lucky because obviously a lot of our friends are not in that position, especially in the hospitality industry. Mm. So yeah, yeah. That's that's but also, do you, I mean, maybe the same for you. I, I find it's important to stay in touch with all the people in the wine regions. So I've 
you know, spoken to people in Bordeaux and Burgundy this because this week, because like, you know, say in Burgundy where they've had like, um, they were worried about frost damage. So like we're focused on the virus, but then like, you know, the, the vineyard keeps going on. So they've had other problems in, in, in say Burgundy and, and also in Bordeaux with the sort of frost. So they can't just sort of, they can't sit at home and just, they've got to get out there and protect the vineyard. So um, I've been speaking to people this week, they said that the, there was a big risk of frost, but fortunately, certainly in Bordeaux, Burgundy, they, they, they've managed to escape it this time. And things, seems to be, things seem to be warming up now. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. We're in this business that is so built around mother nature. And, you know, yesterday speaking with, with Tegan Pasolacqua in Napa Valley, you know, there, the, the rhythm of mother nature is, can be a calming influence. It can kind of be a distraction. It can be a reminder that, hey, this vineyard has been around for 150 years and it's going to be around after this, maybe not another 150, but certainly it's been through a tremendous amount of things. And I think that's obviously reassuring to, to a lot of people. But yeah, it's been a pretty difficult year for a lot of people, even before uh, this current pandemic, obviously, the, for the industry, talking about the whole tariff situation and uncertainty around that. Then we sort of put that on the back burner. Now we have this pandemic. And then you know, these vines do need tending, and especially for Chardonnay, which is more precocious at this time of year than Cabernet or the red wine grapes especially in Burgundy, as, as people have said, the Chardonnay was particularly at risk. You see these pictures of the candles in the vineyards. Uh, there may not be candles technically, but they're burners to keep the temperatures high or water on the vines to freeze the young grapes to protect them, the young vines. Uh, in Champagne, Burgundy, Bordeaux. So it's been a year with a lot of stuff that people have had to deal with. And it's a reminder, yeah. you know, it's mother nature. Yeah, and I, I sort of think back to like uh, the new year when a lot of the emails from France lay like uh, talking about the year, like it's, it's 2020, you know, um, you know, 2020 saying that that's a sign that it's going to be a great year for wine. And then sort of three months later, it's a completely different uh, world, you know? So it's sort of, it's weird to think back to that optimism that was there just, I don't know, two or three months ago. Yeah, and hopefully it's early. I mean, I'm a, a perpetual optimist, so I'm just hoping, you know, at some point things will be clear. Uh, mm. I think the world will be very different for a while, but hopefully there's still enough time for sure to have good quality vintage, you know, that people are still working in the vineyards. I think labor is going to be a very big problem, though. Yeah. What I'm hearing, just getting people to, I mean, if, there, if, if there's uncertainty around the ability to travel, that really could be a very big issue around harvest time for well, seasonal work. I mean, I don't know if you've heard about what happened in South Africa, where um, it seemed to be changing every day. And at, at one point there, none of the wineries were, well, at one point they weren't, they had to finish the harvest at that certain hour. Literally, they went in in the morning and then there was the government decree, you can't, everybody, you got a social distance. and they some some wineries had finished their harvest, but some later wineries that picked later, they were looking at just literally stopping and just letting the grapes rot on the vine. And then fortunately, they they sort of uh, pleaded with the government, look, we've got to finish the harvest. And then even like three or four days ago, the government banned all exports of wine. And so they were taking, you know, very sort of draconian measures. And they said, look, this is just going to, cripple the industry long term. Unfortunately, they've managed to sort of change change P, uh, the, um, the law. So now they can export. But I mean, yeah, Southern Hemisphere is sort of, you know, it was a really bad timing. So um, yeah, but uh, they seem to have got through it. So we'll see. Yeah, I saw that that was really dramatic that the, those, yeah. news, those news reports. Yeah. Um, let's see, here's a question about well from mark powell you look really great so that's obviously fantastic because you know a year ago we who, were look, all, who looks great you, you or me you, i'm not gonna say <laughs> i look great <laughs> gee i thought you look great yeah i tell you looks great <laughs> Neil, yeah. Neil look terrible. Well, yeah. you look great and obviously a year ago we were very concerned so it's good that well it's yeah people people say to me oh you know what's the lockdown like to be honest it's like last year for me because i was in exactly the same situation last year so 
I couldn't really, I couldn't travel for about eight months. So when people say, oh no, we've got to stay, stay in till end of May, I'm like, well, okay, you know, I can deal with that. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm great, yeah. And so tell us a little bit about what you have coming up. There's a question about uh, 2010 Bordeaux. Did you do the 10 year? Yeah, yeah, I've done, uh, so we did 2010, that was in February. And uh, I think that's basically all written and ready to, yeah, it's ready to go. I have, I sort of, you know, I usually have six or seven different articles and, you know, it's very difficult to let them go because you're always thinking back, I can just change that and make it better. So um, I think that the 2010, I was just about to send it off and then the sort of lockdown happened and I thought maybe not quite, though. I just wanted to see how things were going to pan out. But uh, I think, yeah, no, that, that's ready to go. So um, yeah, 2010, it's, uh, and that's all blind as well. So I always think that makes it much more interesting. So the problem with, you know, you have to sort of, you get all your notes and you'll, you'll have some tasting notes that make you look like a complete idiot because you've said completely the opposite to what you said before. So actually a lot of work for me doing that report is, for me, it's important to explain uh, differences in opinion you know has the wine changed did you just miss something you know so I, I go through every single tasting note and I did actually did it twice so I did one I tasted the 2010 cited and then I tasted them again blind so in that report I've got the two tasting notes side by side so you can see um, you know uh, where where wines have performed really well and a couple of them where there's a problem there's a couple of there's a couple of cont controversial ones where, you know, two completely different sets of tastings, different timings, same problem. So, um, yeah. 2010 is an interesting vintage because it was very high alcohol and very high tannin. And I think it was also the height of people wanting to make super extracted wines. And I'm going to be yeah. really curious to taste, to, to read your report. We, as a company made the decision that during this time of, of um, sort of lockdown and stoppage of a lot of things that we're prioritizing the publishing of articles that are new, new releases just because those have the widest appeal. Um, and then, so that's kind of what we're doing over the next couple of weeks is sort of going through our pipeline of all the articles that are done or close to done on, on, on new releases. And then we're, we're gonna circle back and do a lot of these more thematic vintage retrospectives, et cetera. I mean, Neil has his mm. 2010 Bordeaux. I have a ton of older Piedmont and Tuscan notes that have been sitting around for a while. So, so that's gonna happen imminently, but first we wanna get through the, the, the pipeline of new release articles because there's more wine that's available out there for people that yeah. people can actually pick up. So. Yeah, also I find, I don't know, I, I have some articles where I have to rewrite them because the world's changed since I wrote it. And so I read it back something I wrote say in January. And I think that doesn't quite fit into how I would write it now. Mm. So even like the, um, you know, the, 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 the one I wrote on the, 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 the forum dinner we did in January was actually originally a, a normal, a regular fitness table, which I've changed because everything's changed and it wasn't, it wasn't right. You know, that's why we stopped the fitness tables because it just doesn't fit at the moment. Moment, so I yeah. just you have to rewrite it um, to how it fits now. Yeah, and there'll be those will come back as soon as we're sort of in a more normal time for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I never go back and I mean, once we publish things, I it pains me to go back and read anything I wrote. You know, and so I try not to do that because yeah, hey, okay, your perspective is always evolving. So as you come back, to something, you're a different person. Even a week later, a month later, and for sure a year or two later, it's very uh, your perspective is very different. Yeah, I've also got one article. I haven't, I don't know whether I did. There was a, there was something on the, I think it was on the forum saying that I never taste supermarket wines. So I went to a supermarket tasting. I hadn't been to one for quite a long time. So uh, I went to the um, Aldi tasting, um, which I actually found really interesting. I really wanted to taste, I think I tasted 50 wines all at the, I don't know, from four pounds to about 10 pounds, um, which I hadn't done for a long time because I'm always drinking 
other stuff. So, uh, but actually found it really interesting. You know, this is what your average, you know, your, your regular people, they're going to the supermarket and this is what they're tasting. And, uh, you know, there was, there was some great wines there, you know, not, not great as in, you know, it's not like kind of earth shattering, but yeah, there's some wines I would recommend. Oh, well, it's gonna be fun to read that. I'm yeah. curious, you know, obviously you have a chance, I mean, as do I, you have a chance to taste uh, a lot of older vintages, wines that are rare or low production or et cetera, et cetera. But when you open something at home for pleasure, what is the, what are you most likely to, to grab? Um, I like a lot of uh, South African whites, I think are really, really great. Um, I'm drinking this week. I've had a couple of great wines from the Maconay. Um and I do like. I'm one of the. I'm one of the maybe the only people left that I do enjoy a good cheap Bordeaux. You know, I always hear people like, "I don't drink Bordeaux anymore." I think, well, you're missing out because I think, I think, say like uh, a good Cru Bourgeois, you know, is is just fantastic value. So, and great to, to drink during the week and um, you can drink them over a couple of nights and um, they're not expensive, you know. So nothing, nothing grand, but I think, I think that's like a really good, really good value. Yeah. I think for me, my go-to wine is probably something like a Chianti Classico for red, just because of its versatility with food and inexpensive, easy to find, easy to, well, I guess now everything gets delivered. It's crazy. It's just like your place. You know, you, you want to know where I live, just drive around the neighborhood and look for the house with all the boxes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I would like, it, it, it's this one region where I sort of, I used to taste, drink a lot more and I love Italian wines. Um, I saw it, yeah, I have to wind you up about Italy, but uh, I, actually, I really, I really love Italian wines. I've always found it uh, too complicated for me because there's so many great varieties and regions that it, kind of bamboozles me a, a little bit once I get outside Tuscany and, and Piedmont. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I love, I love Italian wines. Um, but, and I'd love to drink more, but uh, you just get channeled into sort of what, what, what you, what I cover. So um, I'll bring them over when I come to paint the walls. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You can bring, bring over some sort of 71, 114 would be nice. Or I just, I have an extra case lying around, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's right there in the corner, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, and then what's the opposite? What's your sort of desert island kind of wine? Desert island kind of wine. Um, well, that I've tasted or that I want to drink now, or that would be if you knew that it was like, okay, this is it. You know, I get one or two bottles to take to the desert island. What would it be? Oh, um, you get, I get asked that question like so many times and then it sort of changes each time. But um, I did love, I, I did a, an amazing uh, dinner in January. So we were still before the virus really hit with uh, Bio Chateau Certain with, mm. um, and, uh, and we did a, a, an amazing sort of vertical with um, Alexander Tiampon, the, uh, the winemaker uh, came over and we had a 1945 uh, BCC, which was just amazing. Really, really, really beautiful. Um, so that, that would be, that's probably one of the best wines I've had so far this, this, this year. Mm. But um, yeah, I mean, um, and Burgundy, of course, you know, um, I'm writing up, uh, I do it every year, I, you know, uh, the sort of the mature Burgundy bottles that I've tasted and, um, you know, Court on Charmant, Costury, the sort of regulars, you know, which, you know, just, you know, they're, they're, they're crazy prices, but you taste them and you think, well, I mean, it's one of the, the there was one bottle that it's one of the greatest white wines I've ever tasted. So, um, yeah, yeah, that kind of stuff. Hmm. How about you? You know, I think it might be, a, it might be champagne. If I, if I was down to the last one, it might be it might be some really great champagne like a 96 Cru Clos de Menil or a great older Cristal or a great old CDC. I don't know. I mean, champagne for me is a great wine. And as I've gotten older, you know, it's interesting. 
uh, my appreciation for white wines has really, I mean, you were mentioning those whites, my appreciation for white wines has really changed the last, I don't know, five or 10 years. I, I'll often decant a, a really nice Riesling or mm -hmm. I just think that a lot of times, and I'm sure I've been guilty of this in the past, is we're like, well, white wine, I have white wine and then we'll drink like the real stuff. And I think that as I've gotten older, I sometimes my, I've thought quite differently about that. I've done tastings where I've put whites in the middle, uh, in, in the beginning also, but also in the middle, sometimes at the end of a dinner. And I just, my whole thinking about white wine is, really evolved in the last, I'd say five years or so. If I, if I could, if there was like an extra day in the week, you know, I would love to spend time in Germany. I would love to cover Germany for us, Riesling. Uh, mm. These are just so fascinating. But for me, it's, I, I, I'd say it's champagne, it's, or it could be something, I mean, if you said like some sort of crazy wine, I happen to really love, as some people know, DRC Montrachet, which I don't get to taste that often, but, and, and Aubert de Vilain likes to chastise me as saying white wines are simple, <laughs> but, <Yeah. laughs> but, I'm on Roche DRC. But I, you know, at 2010, since we were speaking of 2010, you know, like that could be a very nice desert island wine. So. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I still have a little, for me in champagne, I just, all the, the, the stuff that goes around the champagne kind of puts me off a little bit. You know, all the pizzazz and everything. I sort of, you know, I, I got to a stage about, I don't know, about five or six years ago, where I was just, I just felt like um, I just want to get to the actual champagne and not all the packaging and the glitz and the famous personalities that are promoting it. And that sort of slightly put me off champagne. I'm not anti-champagne, I enjoy it. But I do find, I think there's a great quote, I think it's Hugh Johnson who said something like the bubbles in the champagne sort of, they sort of they sort of put you off sort of the, they make it seem a little, um, what's the word? Like champagne is just for fun. It's not cerebral or intellectual. And I know that's a terrible thing to say, but sometimes I feel like that, which is why I could never, I could never do champagne professionally. I enjoy it, but I, I find it quite difficult if you line up 20 champagnes in a row I find it quite difficult to really analyze the differences between them. Maybe yeah. that's me. I don't know. Well, I think there's two challenges with champagne. One is a tasting like that. You have obviously the influence of the bubbles and the sugar. Yeah, it gets that. in the way. It's hard. And then the, the other um, thing there is there's probably nowhere in the world where there's, it's not just that, that glitz and that bling, but you also have the artisan side. And so, to me, even Bordeaux is, is nothing like Champagne when it comes to the incredible separation of like extraordinary glamour and wealth versus extraordinary like artisan burgundy-like type where you have this, this separation is so massive and it is, I think, uh, a challenging region because you are confronted with these two massive extremes of wine, the super branded product versus the pure artisan where you could go, you could go to a place, even though they're very famous now, but you can do this at a lot of estates. You're tasting from the barrel, Van Clare from the barrel, and you could be in Burgundy when you taste with, you know, Francis Egli, or when you go to Salos, you, you know, there's lots of smaller producers too, Chartonia. My, my favorite producer. Your favorite, favorite producer, well. Well, that, somebody asked, what do we disagree on? That's kind of one of them, but um, <laughs> that's kind of a stylistic thing. But you know, when you go to some of these small Burgundy, a uh, small, excuse me, small champagne domains, you are tasting, the Van Clare directly from the barrel as though you were in Burgundy or the Rhone or Piedmont or wherever. And it, so you have these two, uh, these two very different uh, worlds. Um, what, what do you think is the best? You can, if you can't drink champagne, but you want to drink something with a bit of fizz in, where, where would you go? Are you like, do you like Carver or do you have any other regions which you, you enjoy? I think that there's some really nice Cava's like one you wrote about recently. Yeah, that was amazing. Yeah, amazing. The, the the classic uh, regions within for Prosecco, not the expanded area, but some of the specific vineyard designate wines can be really beautiful. I think California makes some sparkling, really delicious sparkling wines too, but they're not inexpensive. So they don't necessarily fit into your parameter, but for sure, Spain and Italy have some great sparkling wines that are affordable and sort of, Following on from that, we have a question about affordable Burgundy, which I've 
answered quite a bit in some other webinars, but and I will hear too as well. But what's your obviously you and I live a very privileged privileged life. We can go visit these estates like Rousseau and Leroy, et cetera, taste these wines either there or through our tasting groups or friends or whatever. But what how would you how should a younger person or somebody who doesn't just doesn't have the means for those wines, which is most of us, because I certainly can't afford those wines myself if I had to buy them largely like that, um, things like Leroy and so on and so forth. How should a young person or somebody who's just getting into Burgundy approach those wines and getting to taste wines that don't cost a fortune? Yeah, it's 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 very tough because like, and I, I've written this two or three times, when I, when I started learning about Burgundy, so going back to the late 90s, I want... I was in the same situation. I had no money, so I had to find what was going to be affordable. And at that time, it was juices like uh, Catia, Grivo, Angel. You know, it's crazy to think about it now, but they, those were the bottles that I bought the most because they 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 weren't they weren't that expensive, and it was a good way to learn about Burgundy. And of course, those those I mean those those growers are now there. You know, you've got to be extremely rich to to be able to afford them. So it's a really, it's very tough. I mean, I think in Burgundy, like the one good thing is that there are more and more great producers now. So it's not so restricted to the kind of obvious names. So like, um, you know, in say, Jevy Chambertin, like uh, you always had like, uh, you know, Rousseau and Duga, Dugaki and so forth. So, then you try and find well who's the next person coming up so there were groups um, producers like i don't know Heritzin manzini uh which i really like and then uh he's become famous now but du rocher when du rocher started he wasn't so well known so he's still pretty well priced relative to the very big guys yeah yeah it's still it's still expensive i think i think the problem is is that um when, when talking about pricing, sometimes I think even, even what we consider to be the less expensive growers is still extremely expensive for the average person. So I think here in UK, the average spend on a bottle of wine is still, it's probably six pounds, something like six, seven pounds. So, you know, um, it means that so it, when you take a region like Burgundy, even when you go down to like uh, village level, um, you know, it's un you know, people will just not pay that that amount of money for it. So, you know, but it's important to go for for, for Burgundy. I go to play, you know, in the Côte Chalonnaise or Maconnais, um, Beaujolais. You know, those places now are so much better than they were when I when I started. You know, um, when I when I started my wine career, you know, it was actually just shipping jumbo jets of Beaujolais Nouveau to uh, Japan. And so that was my kind of, that, that to me was Beaujolais. Now it's full of like small growers, uh, you know, doing, you know, really fantastic things with Gamay. So uh, there's a new appreciation of it. So, but it still makes me sad that what's changed is maybe when you and me started, we still had access to those top producers, not every week, but every now and again, you know, and people will, share them and that's how, how we learn about it and now that door is almost completely closed off and so I sort of understand sort of you know young people feel very disenfranchised you know Burgundy is not for me so they they have no interest in that region and I can completely completely understand that and so that's why you know they'll go to the new world or a type of white natural wines and so on it's yeah. a shame yeah. because you know they, they don't get what it's like to have a great they a don't get what it's the experience of having a great wine and b can you really enjoy it knowing that it costs so much money you know we we lived an age where we weren't thinking about how much those wines actually cost because they weren't they were expensive but they weren't crazy that's a big difference they were, they were expensive but you could share a bottle with a couple of friends or find a way yeah. to drink these wines. And now you have to be a kind of a billionaire. But to me, the biggest issue is that people don't have the references, like what is a Musigny, what is a Chambertin? Because those wines are, you know, you sort of people are growing up without knowing what these things are because they're unaffordable. At the same time, you know, I really enjoy going to these small little villages 
It could be, you know, and tasting of these small producers. It could be like somebody like D David Moreau and Santané, or it could be some of the small producers in the little town like Pernon Vergeles, where you can still taste Appalachian wines or entry level wines that are affordable. Uh, the challenge with Burgundy is also is always the availability of wine. So wine could be inexpensive, but there's two barrels of it. So that's kind of a harder problem to solve. Yeah. But I think, and you mentioned the Cote Chalonez, there's definitely Appalachians that are outside of the Cote de Bonne and the Cote de Nuit or on the periphery that and lesser known areas that are still, that are uh, becoming more interesting. I've tasted some lovely wines from Orange. Okay, they're a little rustic, but you could still buy three bottles and you could, you know, open a bottle without thinking about what it cost on a yeah. Tuesday night at the last minute with your delivery or your pizza or whatever, without worrying, oh my God, I only have one bottle and it cost me such a enormous amount of money or is it the right moment you just open it and there's a joy in just opening a bottle for no reason except yeah. you feel like it and you can do that in some of the lesser known areas of of burgundy and i also think you know chablis is pretty interesting too i mean yeah. yes prices are creeping up and sure if you want to drink dobisado or Ravineau, that's a different story but once you get into the other producers and there's lovely cooperative wines there too as well as you know they may not have the personality of a fully artisan wine, but they still deliver really good, solid, reliable quality for the money. So there's places. La, La Chablisienne, I think, makes great Chablis. You know, they're a huge, big company, but, you know, um, I think they make great, great Chablis. Mm. Yeah. So there's definitely places. Um, curious to know, because we've been asked, what do you think about, well, if you do, do you think there's an over reliance on scores or? Uh, and like the use of the of scores to sell wine, what's your view of how that has evolved in the recent well, years? It's it's kind of you know, yeah. People ask me that a lot. Like, but when you look at like a report, then like the way I do it is I write all the tasting notes and all the scores when I'm doing the tasting, when I'm doing Burgundy from barrel on prima. Uh, usually, if I'm doing a vertical tasting. All the notes, all the scores are done there and then. And actually, most of my time is spent writing the article that will accompany those notes to give it context. And then, you know, I like to try and make it entertaining or to bring something from outside wine into that article and so so on. So most of most of my time is spent making a sort of a complete article where the scores are only a tiny bit of the information. And actually you know, when you're assigning a score, it takes very, very little time um, because, you know, how, how long does it take just to type 90, 95 or, or, or whatever? So, yeah, then it's strange when you've spent, say you're doing your Primeur report and you've written a six, seven, eight thousand pound, uh, six, seven, eight thousand word um, article and then somebody shows you just a list of your wines and the scores and then all those hours you spent writing the article or making the photos and so on are sort of completely ignored and you think well that's not really what i i wrote just those scores and you know one one of the most annoying things is you talk about the over reliance of, of scores is when somebody um comments on the score without reading the tasting note because the tasting note should always explain the score uh, and not just the score but maybe the score you gave it 12 months ago or the score you gave it in barrel because wines change over time so I think I think scores scores I mean I, I like scores I mean I've always scored wines so but to me they're not the most important the most important thing but I think the one, the one people say, oh, you know, how can you say that this wine is this score? But that's looking at wine criticism 20 years ago before the internet. Because say, like on, on Venus, we have the same wine, but it can have different scores, whether it's you or me, or tasting at different times, or tasting at the chateau, and then tasting at home, or tasting from different formats. And those scores can always change. So the scores, they can be sub subjective, you know, they can, they can change. I'm not, not one of these people where the score has to be exactly the same all the time. And they, it can change by quite a lot because we've all opened, you open a case of wine and go through every single bottle. I bet you won't give the same score to every single bottle. It will change slightly. 
and that just reflects how wine is. And I think a score does that quite cleverly. So you can sort of say, well, it tastes it tasted better five years ago. Maybe it's going through a dumb phase, or now this wine has, you know, blossomed, you know, and so on. So, yeah. Yeah, we do a lot to um, to give as much context as possible. I, I the reason I like scores is because, as Neil said, you have to take a view. You know, and we're talking numerical scores as opposed to stars, three stars, five stars, glasses, things where you can finagle a, a two out of three or a four out of five, four and a half out of five, not necessarily upset anybody, be sort of political. A point score obligates you as a critic to take a view and say, this is 90, this is 93, this is 88, this is 97, occasionally this is 100. So you have to have conviction, which we believe in, obviously. The score is only part of the the package, as Neil said, there's an enormous amount of time that goes into tasting these wines to talking about talking to the producers. We haven't talked about it here, but on Primer especially, Neil and I taste many wines more than once. You'll see this in the note, tasted two times, tasted three times, tasted four times. There's very few people who do that at all. So it's going back, testing, tasting, going back. Was I right? Was it sample off? A lot of work. The, the article introductions are very extensive. Neil's are, are like an open, opus just in, a, in and of its own. Um, I've started putting my, some of my articles, translating them into Italian or French because I want to communicate with as broad a range and speak to as many people as possible. We'll be doing more of that. But we've also done some things like published, you know, one, one it was last year on Primer, I published the entire article mine with uh, reviews, but no scores, which really pissed people off in the short term. But after people said, wow, that was, I actually went and read the tasting notes. <laughs> so yeah. we may do more of that. And this year, my Bordeaux, we published just the introduction, the reviews, the second day, because we have a lot that we want to share with you. And, and yeah, it's kind of depressing to see your work be sort of just distilled into a single number, which matters, yes, but the whole context matters. And so we're sort of at the end here. Uh, so I just want to answer one last question. Uh, first, Neil, thanks for being on here. We've had a tremendous turnout and a lot of questions. So we'll do this again, if you agree. Yeah, sure. Thank you all. There's From a question. From the garden shed. Huh? From the garden shed. From the garden right. shed. I'll come and paint it so it'll be fresh and perfect. That looks pretty great. Yeah, here. it's hiking a bit, Antonio. Don't leave it too long. Yeah. And so the last question I want to answer is from a young writer uh, in uh, asking advice on how to build a career. First, the first thing that you say is that you don't you think of us as writers and not communicators. I hope that this web chat might change your view a little bit. But if I had any, had any advice to share, I would say find something that you can do that nobody else can do and then be great at it. And to specialize first, you specialize first, you become the best at something that establishes your credibility as an expert in a subject. And then you use that to become an expert in, in many other things. So um, we are like, we're going to post this on our YouTube channel and on Instagram live. Thanks everyone for watching. Neil, obviously great to chat with you and we will see you all on the other side of this. Thanks and have a great rest of the week. Thank Cheers. you. Stay safe.